session goes from 9.30 to 10.45. So this is going to be exciting. Well, we're going to go ahead in this session learn about the future design and potential for Citrix here at ODOT. We're going to hear from speakers this morning of the ODOT IT architectures, Wally Renner and Sean Stritz. We're also having guest speakers from Citrix. Citrix, I knew I would do that. It's going to be Steve Arrington, Senior Sales Engineer, Dan Mandrick, Field Sales Manager, David Smith, National Director of Sales, and also Jose Padden, who is a Public Sector CTO. And I'll turn the mic over to Sean. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so, like Heather said, um, Sean Stritz, Wally Renner, uh, the guys from Citrix will be up here in a little bit. Um, before we start, uh, this is a poll EV. Um, we're going to have some questions in here, interactive, a um, couple uh, slides. So if you would go ahead, go ahead and get it downloaded, um, get into it through the website, however you want. So before we get deep down into the Citrix part of it, we're going to do a little back to the future, um, see where ODOT was, for where we're at now and where we're going. So, if you would, go ahead and uh, open up your phones. And uh, how many people remember this device at ODOT? There should be one person. <laughs> Good. So... From what I was told, that was a teletype? I don't know. That teletype looks like a typewriter to me. But <clears throat> All right. What was uh, ODOT's first enterprise computer? We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Let us know which one you think was uh, ODOT's first computer. It's the part. Everybody looks, uh, the majority of you think it's B. It's actually A, Vax Terminal. All right, next one. Rank these in the order from oldest to newest. So, correct order is IBM 8086, 8088, TD30, GX1, GX110, Dell GX270, and the HP8100. All right, this one is asking for some uh, a one key, one word response. How was software installed in the past? Manually magic. <laughs> Whose mom was here? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
So <laughs> here's what it looked like in the past we used to use. Anybody here use five and a quarter inch floppy drives to install software? Mr. Dots, we put your Buffalo NAS up there just for you. So, yeah, this is how software used to be installed at the ODOT. Ghost, who here remembers Ghost? The good old days, Ghost. It's nice. First automation, patch link. Lovely. Love it when you come in and you get this nice little pop-up say something installed via patch link. No clues who, what it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a little bit of, uh, we went back to the future, so. So, the DeLorean, it was uh, destroyed. <laughs> All right, so we're moving on to Citrix. What's ODOT's future look like for endpoint computing? Charles' main goal a um, couple years when he came to us, any application, any device, any network, any time. So that's really what uh, in the past we've strived to, to get to. Um, Unfortunately, we haven't got there yet with the products that we, uh, we currently have. Um, so that's basically why, uh, <clears throat> that's why we're uh, looking at Citrix. So with that, we're going to pass it off to um, Jose, I believe. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be back up here shortly. All right, How, how's everybody doing? Good. All right, I'm gonna, I, we, we have a video here that it doesn't look like the audio is playing. Um, so I think we're gonna kick into the presentation and then when, once we get the audio figured out, we'll play that video. Um, but I, you know, I, I saw, uh, I, I see these ODOT shirts that are orange. NFL is in season, is that Brown's colors or is that Bengals colors? Safety <laughs> orange. Safety orange, all right. <laughs> Whoever won. All right. Well, I'm. I'm. A, I grew up in Buffalo, uh, so I'm a Bills fan. So it's kind of. Uh, I don't know if it's a good thing, but the greatest single play in Buffalo Bills history is Andy Dalton throwing a touchdown pass uh, to get them into the playoffs last year. So, um, you know, just wanted to give a little bit of background on on who I am. Grew up in Buffalo. I am the U.S. public sector uh, CTO. So what that means is I lead an organization that goes across the country and helps governments create secure workspaces and make happy users. And while they're doing that, they could see some insight into their IT infrastructure and, and what that means for them. Um, are we good on the video? Okay. So with that, I'll, I'll roll this video and then uh, I'll, I'll have a, a couple words about how, how we could help. Definitely working out. Right. 
So that, that was a nice little commercial just to kind of give you an idea of the potential of what we can do. And that's, that's really you know, what, what I'm here to talk about and why I go around and, and do this is because you know, I've been in IT for about 20 years now. I, uh, I know I got a baby face, but I actually started as a COBOL programmer for Y2K. Uh, after that, I moved into IT. And uh, for the last 13 years, I've been with Citrix helping, helping our government customers and, and working on uh, secure digital workspaces. And right now, I, you know, the last three to five years is, is just the greatest amount of change that I've seen in IT. There's so much that's happening in our, our IT organizations to be able to help us create great user experiences for our, for our users. And that is really adding a lot of complexity. So there's a lot of complexity, there's something new, there's paradigm shifts every day in how we deliver from an IT perspective and how users consume and what they do on that endpoint. But all that complexity has created a lot of opportunity. And that's really what I see and when, when I go around and talk to different states and when I talk to, at the federal government level, there's just so much opportunity for us to enable what people can do. Uh, about 18 years ago, I, when I was an IT guy, our mail server went down, our mail server was you know, just this Windows box that we were playing around with NT, put Exchange on there, it turned into a thing. We didn't expect it to, to grow to what it, what it actually happened. It crashes. Well, we go look at it, RAM's, RAM's gone. RAM's not working. This is before Dell Premier support and HP everything and you can't get a shipment in a couple hours. What they did was they send the new guy, me, out to the store to go buy some RAM. So I went and bought 512 megs of RAM for about a thousand bucks and stuck that in the server and we were able to get everything up and running again. But it, you know, that just kind of shows you, I went to that same store just a couple days ago and I bought an HP laptop with an i5 processor and eight gigs of RAM for 399 bucks. I mean, the potential and what's changed over the last three, three or the last 20 years is just amazing. The, the power that everyone has at their endpoint on the devices in their pockets and on their tables is amazing. And we want to do what we can to, to unlock that potential. All right. Uh, let's see if we can get this going. There we go. And what's also changed is the way people work, right? So it's, it's you know, going into an office and, and be able to get things done, that's always gonna be important. That's a critical part of what we do. But people wanna work where they are on the devices that they wanna work. And that's what we see, and that's what our customers ask us to do, and that's what we wanna make sure that we can enable, to make sure that people can get done what they need to do, where they need to do it. This guy looks like he's about to take a nap over there, <laughs> and he needs to shoot something off right before that. But if that's the time that someone wants to get something done to help the state of Ohio and help the people in Ohio, we wanna enable that. We wanna make that a reality for people to be able to do. And you know, as, I, as I've been in IT for 20 years, the, the first 10 years, uh, especially in, in IT support and talking about infrastructure, is the millennials are coming, the millennials are coming. That's what everyone talked about. Well, you know, today, the millennials make up the greatest percentage of workers in the workforce. And really, what people want when it comes to uh, being able to deliver services is they want things that just work. So your users are millennials and are going to increase that generation and the generation after is going to come on board and what people want to do is have simple things that work. It's not an unrealistic request. It shouldn't have to be very complex or you need some type of IT degree in order to get your work done. That should just happen naturally, right? And that's what we want to make sure that, that we can enable. That's the opportunity I see and, and how we can, I, I think we can help. And you know, what's really important in how you win in IT is to get the best tools to your people when and where they need them to empower them to do their job. That's what we think we can help with, and it sounds like it's the vision that, that we have for ODOT to make sure that, that, that we could do that. So it looks like we're on the same page when it comes to that. And how you deliver that, there's three key pillars to that. So in all of IT, through all of IT history, right, there's the user experience. We want to make sure that people have a, a good user experience and can do what they need to do. There's choice, so the ability to do, to, to, to do something differently or have some selection in how they get things done. And security, all of this has to be done in a very secure manner to keep the IT data integrity and the system safe, right? 
And traditionally, what we've had to do is make some compromises, right? So if we want to have a great user experience, we might have to reduce choice, right? So we can make these two user experiences amazing, but if you want to do something else, sorry, that's not supported, we can't do that, right? That's kind of the traditional IT approach. And then if we want to bolt on some additional security, well, maybe we've now decreased our choice a little bit less, decreased our user experience, and you know, we have a very secure solution, but no one could use it. Uh, and then when it comes to choice, if we increase the amount of choice that we give to our users, the, the balance to that is we might decrease our security or open up more holes to that. Uh, and, and we might actually you know, kind of diminish the user experience because people will have too many options and not know the right way to get connectivity in for what they're trying to do. So we think with choice, experience, and security, you don't have to compromise, right? You can deliver a great user experience, allow your users to choose that any, 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 and have security that's built in right through the system as, as, as you deploy it and as you manage it on the back end. And we think that work is, is not a place. We talked about that earlier, right? So it's not only work from a user's perspective of where they are, but it's work on a device. People should be able to choose what device they feel more, most comfortable with, do that in a, in a secure, wear, uh, secure manner. And on the back end, choice also comes down to how the apps are delivered, right? So there's increased amount of, of SaaS that's happening. There's on-prem and there's cloud data centers that can be used. A user shouldn't have to know where that service is coming from them. If it's in a cloud, if it's on-prem, you know, if it's in somebody's closet, it shouldn't matter. You get access to, to everything in one place and it just works, right? And that's what, that's what we see and that's what we want to make sure that we can enable. So traditionally, if you try to, to put together a system like this, you would get a lot of best of breed solutions that work really good for maybe one choice or one type of security. And now we need to have them talk to each other. And now we need to have them integrate. And now we need to have them work uh, in a way that maybe they weren't designed to work in order for a certain system to be able to talk to them. And there's a lot that can happen from a complexity. And increased complexity creates increased cost, right? So we think that there's a better way to do this, right? We can do this in a single integrated system that focuses on having a great user experience, enables choice and add security, and that does that not locking you into certain uh, decisions on the back end, right? From a user's experience, one place to go. Doesn't matter what device they're on, doesn't matter what they're using, it all looks the same. Right? And they know what to do d depending on the scenario. So if they're you know, at home trying to do to remote work, it's the same system it, that they're on network trying to do something maybe in a different location. It's easy, it's, it's very secure, and it allows the people to do the work the way that they want to. So we went around and asked. We asked people that are using a secure workspace, secure digital workspace, and we said, what do you like about it? What don't you like about it? And what we found out is that from a, you know, users polled in these surveys is that the users told us that they can solve problems better, quicker, and come up with no, new ideas by using a secure digital workspace. And I just want to hit on that for a second because you know, in the IT world, we get kind of caught up and we're thinking about the architecture and we're thinking about the security policies that we need to follow and you know, what we're going to do from RAM CPU and a virtual server perspective. And all of that is what we do in order to deliver these systems out. But at the end of the day, what makes that system successful is if your users get pulled and they said, I can solve my problems faster. I can solve my problems faster and I can come up with new creative ideas because of the systems that you deliver. That's a win for IT, right? If you pull your users and you say, I have better customer service because of what you guys have delivered to us, I can easily self-service, make a change, I can easily get access to new apps and data that I, that I wasn't able to access before. I don't have to get into a ticketing system all the time now because I could do certain things on my own and it's easy, right? That's a huge win for IT. And you know, when it comes to collaboration, work is done in teams and groups and across different geographical areas. And if the users come back to you and say, I can collaborate much easier and I can get my job done quicker because of the system, huge win for IT, right? And that's the goal that we, that, that we have and that's what you know, we think we can help with. And you know, we do this in a way that doesn't lock you into anything, right? So if you want to use a cloud solution, go ahead. Pick one, we'll support it, it works. 
If you want to use uh, on-prem solution, pick it, go ahead, it works. Pick your hypervisor, pick your hardware platform, we'll support it, it works. And the key thing is it doesn't change the way the users interact or the experience that they're gonna have. It's a choice that you get to make. You wanna change that choice or have multiple different pieces in that back end, go ahead, go for it. You know, it's, it's all about flexibility, it's all about choice. So this is, um, it, it's funny, I, I put this, I kept this one in, in there because it's exactly the same as the one that's on the o, o, o dot, uh, template, right? This is the any, any, any message. You know, we're 100% in alignment with this. This is what we want to do. This is what we believe. This is what all the people in our company spend their hours focused on, is to make sure that people can work anywhere, anytime, on any device, do that secure, securely, and, and do that to and from any cloud. That's what we're about, that's what we try to do, and that's what I think you know, we can help with. So if we break this down one level and just you know, kind of talk high level, what makes up the secure digital workspace? What makes up uh, you know, this, this ability to, to allow the choice security in it and uh, experience that the users need? There's three major pillars, and we'll get into some of the details later, right? So the first one is the workspace itself. This is what the users interact with on a daily basis. That's the first pillar of, uh, of the system. The second is the networking. Obviously, the, the apps and data are not where the user are, they're somewhere else, right? So we need to connect securely through a network and do that in a way that we can, we, we can trust and people will have a great experience no matter what the network condition happens to be. And then the last piece is analytics, right? So if you think about what we do and where we sit in IT infrastructure, we see the endpoint, right? We see the network, we see the back end and any cloud systems. Through that, there's a lot of instrumentation and there's a lot of data that we can capture and deliver and allow you to do things in a proactive manner. So, you know, if we, if we break down that workspace, that's really about having a, a very simple and easy way for users to get in access, do that in a secure manner from an authentication perspective, and have that unified across multiple devices, right? So it's not something foreign, it's not something that shouldn't take a lot of training for users to get access to. It should be a natural way for people to, to get in and do their work. And if we break that down to the networking perspective, the networking is critical for great user experience, right? We wanna, we wanna be very adaptive and be able to understand different network conditions, but also from a security perspective. So instead of security being something that you bolt on at the end of your network and hope people don't you know, create this big wall and hope people don't jump over it, we think that security should go down to the user wherever they happen to be. We call that a secure digital perimeter and you know, we imagine that wherever that user, that guy taking a nap in, in that airport, we, we follow the security with him around that person in that device and make sure that data can't leak and bad people can't get back into the network through that. That's built into the system as we do that, it's a key component. And then again, analytics. So you know, we, we, there's so much data on there that we can do and you know, it looks like ODOT is doing a great job in being able to, to have and capture that instrumentation and act on it. And that's in alignment 100% with what we try to do. And, and we also try to take that to the, to the levels that, that you wanna be where you can have automatic re, uh, reaction to some uh, uh, situation. So we can see what does a good user experience look like. We can have a baseline over time. This is what a great user experience looks like. When there's deltas and variations to that, we can not only do alerting, but we can actually take some uh, automatic uh, automation to try to correct certain things to make sure that people still have a great user experience or try to fix problems before they become a SEV1 you know, ticket system that everyone's got to scramble to try to fix. So it's, it's a critical component to our, uh, the automation and, and the analytics piece is a critical component to what we're trying to do and it's something that we think uh, you know, we can help with. So at the end of the day, right, it's, it's about enabling the people to do what they need to do and allowing the, the people in your organization to be empowered to live up to the potential of all the devices we have in our pockets and all the IT systems that we can deliver to them to create success for ODOT and, and have that future success. So that's, that's what we're about at Citrix. And now I, we're gonna, Steve and Wally and Sean are gonna come up and, oh, sorry, Dan. Dan's gonna yeah, come I'll, up and- I'll do a little segue here for everyone. So Dan Mandrick, I'm the field sales manager here for the state of Ohio. 
Uh, so let's get the blue suits up here in a, in a row yeah. so we can. We, we, we coordinated, so we want to make sure. We just want to you know, show everybody yeah. that uh, we didn't follow the dress code, no. Um, no, it's been a privilege working with these guys for the past five months. So what we're going to get into is kind of a demonstration on what the teams have built so far so you guys can see something real life in action, you know, how it's working, a couple of the functionality pieces that are connected up to the different devices. Um, but what I wanted to touch on, just to give everybody just kind of a high level, uh, this is a pretty wordy slide, but there's basically two themes in this. So when we came in originally to work with this group, uh, they have actually a, a rock solid uh, deployment strategy and how they've been running things. I think everybody's aware of the talent here at ECT. Uh, there was a couple things that we recognized that we could improve upon to achieve that vision of any app, any device, any network. And basically those are hinged around two things. One is simplicity. Jose touched on it. Uh, really the simplistic approach to our service. So we are pretty confident here in what we're going to show that even users at District 10 will be able to kind of latch on to the system and work. No, that's a joke. No. <laughs> No, I was told I should give District 10 a hard time. Um, but no, the simplistic approach to it, so that was one of the things that we recognized right now is that not every application necessarily is baked into the image. So how can we make something a little bit simpler for users to get that application and, and be able to hit the ground running with it? Uh, the second thing was when new endpoints come in, right? What is the process with imaging and baking in these things, right? And so we're gonna talk about some of the things that you know, we've done today. Maybe even you know, Sean can talk about some of the things that we have hooked up here right now and uh, what we've been able to see, but uh, basically we want to enable the user at the end of the day. You know, from a lot of the, the things that Steve is gonna show that he's been working with the team on are around automation and around providing self-service. So uh, the two big takeaways that we saw are just making things simpler to the user and enabling them to get their job done on the device and in real time that they need to. So um, before we hand it over, I wanna make sure that uh, you know, we recognize Jose, I appreciate you coming here to support the efforts. And then uh, David Smith, he's our national director for state and local government. Uh, so I just want you guys both to see their faces. They're gonna be hanging around the conference here. So if you do wanna pick their brains, provide some anecdotes maybe around how some of our other customers within the public sector are leveraging Citrix. Uh, we wanted to bring them out here just to basically show that we're invested in this deployment and we wanna see you guys you know, be successful here. Um, so with that, I guess, Steve, if you want, we can jump into some of the demo. Yeah. yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you. So what we're going to do is we're going to start a demo for you guys. Um, the videos not only are for fluff, but what we like to show is that this, we, we on purpose took all the servers down in Citrix and put it to one server only. And it is running over this ASA, over a VPN, and we are, the entire presentation has been streamed from one server in central office off of a Citrix box. So you guys can see actually how it, um, it will function via a field office. So we potentially simulated a field office itself. What we've never done before um, is when Charles's vision was to any app, anywhere, any device, we've never been able to fully have a Windows application on an iPad, on an Android device, on a Thing client, on a Windows, and have that seamless experience. So we're going to simulate how we can have, if I'm at home and I'm working on my iPad, an experience of what we're gonna do. This is Milestone running on an iOS device. So, I, and on an iPad. So you can run this, if I'm running this on my iPad, um, and I go over to this field office over here and I'm working at home and I close this down, and I'm gonna walk over here to this field office and I log in in the morning. And Alex, can you uh, make that happen, please? What's going to happen is, is this is your session persistence. It will take your session from your iPad and it will go over to your thin client. In one second. Are you sure? Yes, I am absolutely sure. So now, this is an Android device running a Windows-based application. You have total interaction of what you have. It brings over your X drive, your W drive, whatever you want to do. So now I get a call and I have to go to central office for a meeting. So now I'm driving to central office. That's driving. So, and I log into my computer at central office. Same application, same premise behind it. I'm working on Milestone. We're going to start with that. And when I log on, my exact session that I have will follow me from place to place to place. So to 
enable Charles's vision is this allows us to have any application anywhere on any device. Now the experience may be a little different on an iPad versus a computer, but you can see that the entire functionality is there. The next thing we like to do is now, so I'm at this place, I want to open Site Manager. So I have to put a ticket in or I'm doing a change order in Site Manager. This Site Manager will open. And now you see that we have Site Manager on this app. So we'll do it one more time. Can I go back to this one? So I'm going to go back to my field office once I'm done with my meeting at Central Office. And I'm in the middle of a change order and I log back on to my session that I currently have open. Alexander, double click the button. <laughs> and he doesn't type his password right. But you can see that your session stays persistent throughout any device that you're on. What this does is this, this promotes the mobility that you can work from home, you can work from any field office, your car, wherever you need and whatever internet you have, this will be provided over. We degraded the internet on purpose and put it down to one server with low resources so you can actually see the, entire, the entirety of you traveling from X to Y to Z, a field office to a meeting, at home, wherever you may want to be. And then let's say that I am in my app and what I want to do on my Thin client, my Linux-based Thin client, is open Bentley because I have to make a change order in Bentley or I have to update an actual design. So we're going to open Bentley, a Windows-based app, on a Linux-based device. Alex, you have to click the other button. <laughs> Just click it. There will be an opening in the ECT. <laughs> <laughs> But as you can see, Bentley is still graphically intensive. Yes, it's linear based, but we still have the ability to use a Windows device on a Linux based app and realistically we can pull it back to the iPad. Windows app on a Linux That's what I device. said. That's what I meant. <laughs> you know what I mean. You speak me. So you see that now we can have a device that uses any application, any based, no matter what flavor you choose. So how does this help us? Everybody has the pain of upgrading. <laughs> look, low hands. Um, everybody has the pain of upgrading a client. If you get a new device and you have to hand install ten applications, it's just a pain. We don't want to do that. We want you to be able to have an update and go, "Dang, ECT just updated my computer. Now I have to reinstall my device." Or I lose my device. What if we can just give you a computer, which this is. This is directly out of the box. It's, there's nothing on it. We don't put any policy whatsoever. We just installed the Citrus receiver and you have all your applications. Then you don't have to deal with us anymore. Maybe. So don't clap. <laughs> Do not clap. You're all fired when I'm CIO. The big thing over here that when we're showing this on the Thin Client is, is you know, Everybody here hates thin clients. I know. Yep. Um, they hate thin clients because we have to have a virtual desktop. We didn't have a virtual desktop over here. You're not. You're not logging into a VDI box. You're not logging into a desktop. You're literally streaming the app from Citrix to this thin client. They don't have to wait for a login. They don't have to wait for you know the profile to load. It's literally the app is running off of this IGEL thin client. So. Yeah. So we're going to transition to Steve. He's going to talk about um, some future endeavors we may embark in, uh, and then we can, if we have questions, we'll, we'll hold them to the end. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, you know, you guys saw this demo, you guys saw these applications, and one of the really important things that uh, I've been talking to Sean and Wally about was, okay, we, we have this application catalog, we have a way for end users to get this, but how can we automate, from an end user perspective, 
getting my applications? How can I get access to them, right? And, and that is the key question. You know, in, in the past, it sounds like the way that things have worked was end users would have to submit a ticket into ServiceNow. The ticket gets sent over to the appropriate team. The appropriate team takes a look at it. Is this user approved to have this application? Manual intervention is required to add them to a particular group or actually push down the software to that endpoint, right? So. What used to maybe take one day, two days to get an application down to your machine, then it's got to get locally installed, you know, is, is probably in the way that it's been, but the way that we're looking for it in the future is how can we automate this, right? So we know that you guys are a ServiceNow shop, and one of the things that we have with integration with ServiceNow is the ability for an end user, yourselves, to actually go in and select what application you guys want from an application catalog. An automated workflow gets kicked off in your service now that says, you know, Wally needs access to, I don't know, maybe it's PowerPoint in this case that we're using here today or Bentley MicroStation. Automation gets kicked off. The end user is assigned the application. You just refresh your desktop and the application is now right there in your desktop, right? So I have a little video that's gonna actually show you guys from an end user perspective how this works. So that's what I'm gonna show here right now. So that was a short little video. I, I know that was actually showing you guys getting a, a user provisioning themselves a desktop in this case. But you know what we're talking about today and what we've been working with the team on and, is to provision applications. And it works in the exact same process. I know your service now may look a little different from there. But as, as you guys could see, it's really that simple. Um, you know, the, the workflows and things are in place so that an end user like yourself, again, you go in, you say, I need this application. As you can see, it was as simple as just adding it to a cart, ordering it. When you're, on a, when you're on your endpoint, whether it's a thin client or whether you're on an iPad or whether you're on a desktop, you just simply right click and refresh and now you have your applications. So I guess what we're going to talk about next is uh, some upcoming initiatives that uh, the team is working on. I've been talking with uh, Kevin and his team a little bit about uh, some other things that uh, you, know, you guys may have needs around, right? And, and one of those things was simply you know, talking to them, we need a better way to share files um, and, and collaborate. Um, the solution that uh, you know you guys are working with today, you know, I understand is FTP solution, but those are legacy solutions, right? Those solutions have been out for a while. Um, they're a little clunky to use um, from the back end and the admin side. They can be a little bit more admin intensive to to manage those environments. So, with the solution that we're working with this team on right now, um, it, it's about really five main things, right? It's it's about securing a mobile productivity for people, right? So, no matter whatever device that you're actually on. Um, you need access to a particular document and we're going to deliver that document to you no matter what device you're on, right? Uh, collaborating across boundaries is really referring to, you know, often I, I've shared a lot of files with these guys I'm um, using this solution and, you know, I don't work for ODOT, right? So when I need to send them files, I'm going to send them a link to a file. Um, there, there's a lot of different things with those files that we can do. Um, you know, instead of uh, it coming from a file server, I simply go into my home drive on my desktop I, I really right click and I say, you know, send a link to this file and these guys get a link to a file, they can view it online or they can actually choose to download it. And from an end user perspective, when we start looking at all these things and we talk about, you know, being flexible, um, whether you have on-premise storage, so for instance, uh, as an end user, you know, you guys mostly today, uh, after, you know, talking to the team, you guys have a lot of your data and things in your, is it H drives, I believe, you know, you, you, W drives, all right, thank you. So you guys have your W drives, right? You guys have things stored there, but you guys want to share files. So the antiquated system and things that you guys may be using right now says I'm gonna go in, I gotta go into my FTP system, I gotta create a request for this, I may have to have users have credentials to actually get access to these files, right? So we need this to be a little bit more flexible whether the file is sitting here or in the future as you know, ODOT looks to move maybe some of the data and things out to the cloud, I still need to get access to these files even though they're in the cloud, but I need to do it securely. 
And so really that's, that's what I'm gonna kind of show you guys next with this solution is kind of how that's done and, and what the solution looks like. So I'm gonna fire up my own personal laptop here. Yeah, thanks Wally. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna kind of show you guys a little bit of really two main features of the application. There's a lot of different ways within the file sharing solution that you guys can actually send files to end users, but I'm gonna really show you probably the two main ways that uh, most of our customers uh, use the solution today. So uh, for example, um, you're in your email and uh, I need to send files to Sean and Wally, right? So I'm gonna click on the new email and I'm going to send an email to Sean, and I will send an email to Wally, right? And there is, well, if I could spell Wally, there we go. Walter, I should say. Thanks. Yep, you're welcome. Uh, so uh, um, we're gonna actually share this. We're, we're, I'm just gonna put that this is a demo for now, but now I'm within my email, right? Um, please take a look here. And so what I'm going to do now is you can see I have a plugin uh, for sharing files, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and click on this plugin. Now there's, there's two types of things that you guys can actually do with the solution. As you see here, there's share files and request files, right? The, the point of sharing files, and I'm gonna click through this and show you how this works. So the, the idea behind sharing a file is simply I'm gonna have a file that's gonna be in a location. I'm actually gonna send these guys a link to the file. And there's a lot of security behind this that you hold as an end user that you guys can put in place. For instance, uh, when sending this file, I'm gonna share a file here with the team. So this is actually gonna connect back into, in my case, we, we call it an S drive. Um, so I'm gonna go into my S drive, I'm gonna go into my personal folders here, and I am going to send these gentlemen a file on the ServiceNow integration that we were looking at a little bit, er that we were looking at a little bit earlier, right? I wanna send these guys um, a PDF white paper for it. So I select the file, and then I go ahead and I click on, I click on add, right? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna insert a link for Sean and Wally, and they've seen this before because this is how I send them files all the time. Um, this email is gonna get sent out to Sean and Wally and they can actually click and download this attachment. Uh, so when they click on this link, it's actually gonna go out to the website, it's gonna show, okay, I can download this attachment or it's gonna open up in a viewer. Um, the, the other thing that you guys can do, and I kinda talked a little bit about when you share a file, and I'm gonna show you guys here, I'm gonna insert another link. Uh, I will pick. I don't know, we, we can pretty much pick any file here, but I'll pick the same one just to keep it consistent. So when I pick this file and add it in here, there's something that says edit message options. Now this is something that I was talking, telling you about puts the security in the hands of the end user, right? So in this case, I'm just asking Sean and Wally when they get this to enter in their name and email address when they simply download the file. Um, what you guys can also do is if you guys are sending files internally, you guys can select sign in. So in other words, the end users can sign in using your domain, username, and password. That way there's actually a really good audit log and a trail as far as who opened this application, right? So um, you can actually put allowing anonymous access. So if you guys are just sending out, I don't, I don't know, like a simple picture or, or whatever the case may be, you don't really care who opens it. You don't care if people enter in their credentials. You can also do that low level of security as well. There's expiration policies and things that we can set in here, right? So we, we can say that it expires after one day, it expires after three days, it expires after a week, right? I think you guys get the idea. You can make it never expire as well. And then simply, you can turn on a notification that says anytime somebody actually downloads this, I wanna be notified that people are actually downloading this. And where that's particularly, particularly useful is when you're requesting files. So when you actually request a file, so I'm sure a lot of you people work on a lot, of, a lot of projects together, so you guys are collaborating across teams, and oftentimes when you're collaborating across teams, you guys need to share files. And when you're trying to share files, it's like, where do I put my files? Maybe there's sensitive files, so now I gotta go create a network share. I have to put in a request to IT to lock down the network share to these particular people with this particular level of security that they can read it, they can write it, they can have admin access to this. So what this gives you the ability here when you request files and create that folder to share files in, you guys can again, the people that you guys put on that list of people through the tool will actually put that level of security on. So it's empowering you um, as the end user to make your lives a lot more efficient, a lot easier to share files. And really, lastly, the, the other thing I'm gonna show, show with this is I just showed this to you with Outlook, but 
Obviously, a lot of people are just going to work locally off of your computer here, so I'll click on my S drive here. And as you can see, it's simply just mirroring what you guys saw before, and as you guys look through any of these files, you can simply just right-click in all the same workflows that we were just looking at before. Um, and of course, this is, you know, when I right-click, it's not going to work, right, because this is a, a demo in front of a room of people. Um, but uh, simply put, all the same workflows and things that you guys would have in place that you just saw within the tool, all are right-click enabled here. So you're able to share those files, check those files out, and open from here, it'll directly open an email. So that's really, you know, what I have on some upcoming initiatives. So I'm going to hand this back over to these guys to talk about some of the next steps and uh, get this all hooked up for them. So next steps is uh, we're currently in uh, POC. Um, we are uh, doing some demos right now um, with uh, a couple um, of the of the people out at the district. Um, eventually, um, within the next couple weeks, uh, we'll be expanding the POC, um, looking for more IT um, buy-in, buy-in support, testing, um, and then. From that, um, once everything goes well, then we'll, we'll be looking at a, um, a phase rollout. So um, as you can see up on the screen, uh, this is kind of where we're at. Uh, we have to do a hardware upgrade, um, production build, UAT testing, and then phased rollout. So that's where we're at now. And what the next steps are. It doesn't walk through. Huh? And basically, uh, we're at the question, so I know we're running short on time here. Um, before we get into questions, I know, uh, I believe there's two people here that, uh, that have used Citrix. Um, Mr. Simon Herring, in the past, he's uh, used Citrix, and then um, Mr. Dots, uh, he's been using Citrix for two, three weeks now. Um, so. I, if you guys would like to speak and let us know what your thoughts or Citrix are as an unbiased opinion, please go right ahead. Rock, paper, scissors, is he goes first? You ready? Here you go, Muffin. We have 30 minutes. Muffin. I thought it was 10, 15, <laughs> um, yeah, I just, <clears throat> all right. So I've been using oh Citrix God. for about three weeks. Um, it's actually kind of amazing um, for everybody who thinks, well, and it's just VDI again, it, I assure you it's not. Um, I don't see uh, Hiram Crabtree in the audience, but I wanted to tell him he was right. <laughs> Back when he used to use terminal services and uh, we kind of pushed him into VDI instead. This is, this is more like the terminal services days and the terminal services gateway on you know, if you've, if you've messed with it at all. Um, but the Citrix has been amazing. I use it for the office suite. You, you really can't tell what application is running locally and what's running, uh, you know, on Citrix. So I don't know what else to say there. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Herring? I brought my own microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Carry one around with me for uh, occasions just like this. Um, so Citrix may be a new uh, platform for some of you, but I actually did my first Citrix project in uh, 1997. So they've been around for a while. I did another Citrix project in 99 for IBM Global Services at Ameritech. And then as many of you know, um, I'm a consultant. And I have some uh, other customers that I work with um, around town. Very large hospital uses uh, Citrix. Um, it's vital to, to, to the way they do business. And when you're taking care of um, you know, critical care patients, it really matters that your system is up and available because that's how they, that's how they save lives. So availability is, is, a, is a huge bonus off of this. Uh, but I think you know, from a security perspective, um, when I think about what Citrix could do for this organization, I think um, you think about security, security's all about boundaries, that's what people think, you know, you, you're keeping me from getting in, it's difficult. Um, you know, we, we need those boundaries. Um, Citrix actually breaks those, those boundaries down, it removes the barriers to access, but continues to keep things secure. 
Our current VPN solution, or our main remote access solution, is not application aware. It doesn't have application intelligence. So when you need access to something, you may be granted VPN access, only to find out you still can't access what it is you needed to, you know, to use. You may not have access to a file share. You may not have access to a server in your district. And that's because the access control lists that we create, which are very extensive, um, haven't been updated. We, we didn't know that you need to access that. So that could take two days, could take three days to resolve. The Citrix solution uh, maps or marries you to the applications that you need access to because it is application aware. So when I think about this from a security perspective, I see a, a, a very bright future uh, where we no longer need to maintain complex access lists and the end user doesn't need to dialogue with the help desk and say, um, do I need VPN for this? Um, I can't get access to this application, what's wrong? Well, that must be a network problem. Well, guess what, it is a network problem. The access list hasn't been updated. So um, obviously I'm excited about Citrix. I think this is a really good move. Um, I think we could see a time where the VPN client goes away entirely. There'd be no more VPN client. Um, the ASAs could potentially go away. Is that right, guys? Well, there's some cost savings involved in that. That reduces our complexity. Uh, that gives us the ability to stand up project sites faster, uh, as well as troubleshooting them um, a whole lot faster without reducing the security that we actually need. So if you can't tell, I'm excited about, uh, I'm si excited about Citrix. So Simon says Citrix. <laughs> And this was not a paid endorsement. So, questions. Who has questions? Citrix guys are here, beat them up. That's what they're here for. Go ahead, Katie. I think you guessed what I want to ask. So, when we implemented the site manager on the existing VDI infrastructure we have today, you guys, I know, struggled and really spent a lot of time and effort trying to figure out how to allow our log into that PDI environment with an external KD account. Couldn't do it securely. So we are internally creating a B Active Directory account for external customers to log in into that one account. <coughs> These are customers of ours that also have external accounts for many other business apps. They have to manage those that both those accounts for two different products. Three different products, four different Is there a way to implement that particular piece of software? Because it's going to be here another five, six years potentially, a minimum, to allow that business group on the outside to log in with that one account, regardless of the system we're trying to access. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, we talked about this with these guys uh, when they first came on site. Um, Citrix is, or uh, Site Manager was not the main application that we we looked at for this, but it was one of the top ones because, like Katie said, we did have some complexity when we uh, put the Site Manager in VMware VDI. Um, talking with these guys, part of the Citrix uh, uh, package is a, a product called Netscaler, um, and I believe through Netscaler we'll have the ability to do multi-domain um, and bring in that ODOT online domain, so. That's a massive yeah. experience improvement for our construction. So, so I'll tell you, you know, it, it, um, you know, across our user base and some of the biggest use cases are that contractor access. So if you, if you could think of some of the largest federal contractors that exist, the people who build tanks and planes and, and ships, they have people that are on site at a federal government agency, right? And they, they can't get access and they're very restricted on what devices can be brought in and what they could do. So the use case of, of having these contractors on site and, and get access not only to the, the federal systems and do that in a secure manner, Citrix solves that, right? And, does, and solves that in a way that allows that secure connection and secure transaction all the way through without having a grant complete access to the entire network and allow everybody to, to do what they need to do inside the network. We keep that isolated, we bring that secure perimeter down to that user, and we only allow maybe one specific application from a specific use case in, and we can do that in a very secure manner and make it easy for, for you to manage on the back end. 
It's a, it's a very common use case. That's how a lot of people will maybe start with Citrix and then expand into a lot of other use cases from there. Questions? Who else has a question? Well, you guys got tons of questions. Come on. Impact on software. It's all free. <laughs> <laughs> no, so right now we control software licensing with global group management. What we're going to do, a big transition moving to Citrix is we have to change the way we think about software licensing. Right now, if Alex wanted to um, a Visio on his machine, right, I have to tie that license as Express Metrics to that machine. That's a problem because you want to be mobile and you and Charles' goal is to promote mobility. What we need to do is then transition the machine-based licensing to user-based licensing. And what Citrix allows you to do is you can say, Missy's allowed to open this app once on one machine only. So essentially, you're still opening that one app and you're licensed for that app, right? But no matter what you go to, you have that app installed and it's for, one, for you only and it follows with you. So it says with your session persistence with you and you still maintain that license, um, your license management. What Charles also wants to do though, is that say you want Visio, and I know we all install Visio on somebody's machine and they use it once a year. It's very, very inefficient. So I believe it allows us to check in and out, right? So with the Citrix uh, and ServiceNow integration, we're a lot, we can put a time to live on the application. Say it's that one time a year that you want to, your, um, the AA has to um, make the TO change, right? And they only need, uh, Visio for five days. They can check it out for X amount of times and at the end of that time when that expires, that license goes back into the pool so somebody else can buy it. So the, the synergistic effect is, is that we don't need to buy Visio for everybody. We can buy a smaller quantity, save more money, and then share that license when it's checked in and checked out. So we end by maintaining the actual ratio from a one-to-one -one, uh, situation. Yeah, I was just going to add, you know, there, there are a couple elements around software licensing that we deal with with customers on a regular basis. One is, um, one of the problems we solve is over-provisioning of, of software, right? So, uh, typically to simplify desktop management, you make big images of lots of applications and therefore have to over-provision over the, uh, the applications. And now because either role-based or individual-based, you can publish applications to end users, you have a very simple ability to rein in the number of licenses you need. Um, we don't necessarily change the licensing model of whatever software vendor you're dealing with, right? So if, it, if it's Microsoft and it's user-based licensing or if it's someone else that has concurrency-based licensing, we don't change the model, but we allow you to control the model. So you can restrict the number of sessions that can happen. You can restrict the number of users that could potentially have access to an application through both our own management and the integration with ServiceNow. So you have both elements of control on who gets access to what and for what purpose. Any more questions? Okay, everybody can go home. You have another question? You're, okay. yes. File share, you guys are looking into that seriously? Yes. That's a Kevin. Does that make you happy? <laughs> so, so just to add one thing on the file sharing real quick. So our, our view of this space, this uh, the larger space is called content collaboration uh, in the market. Um, there's two elements here. One is most of our customers have lots of different file repositories. They ne never just have one, right? And a lot of solutions say, in order for you to manage files well, you need to move all your files into our new, brand new content collaboration tool. We don't say that, right? Our, our goal is to provide the user an aggregation point of all the content collaboration tools that they have, whether it be file shares, uh, if you are using Office 365 and you have OneDrive, if you have other third-party sources, if you have document management tools, provide one point of aggregation, right? That also means one point of search. It also means you know, it's a lot easier to find stuff. So that's, that's the first piece. The second piece is what can you do with those files once you, once you have access to them? So what was demonstrated was how do I send somebody a file or how do I receive a file? But in most cases, 
The things you do with files are much more complex, right? It's, I have a document that I need to route for approvals, maybe put a signature on. So there are some pretty, there are much more in-depth capabilities that are in the, that portion of the workspace because it, we're looking at it as how do people use files, not necessarily where does a file get stored. Uh, one thing that uh, we didn't mention too as well that I wanted to bring up and from a security perspective, I'm sure Simon's going to love this as well, but with that tool, uh, there's a lot of um, auditing and reporting that you can do, right? So it's, it, it includes things in reporting in the tool that say, you know, everything that you guys do, every file that you send, you can turn the tool on and turn the auditing up to a level that says this file was moved from this share to this share. Uh, Sean, Wally, Steve checked out this file. They looked, they viewed the file three times. They downloaded the file four, five, six, seven times, right? So it's, there's an audit trail that all this has so that you guys can actually keep track of where are my files going, who's opening my files, et cetera. So that's, that is a built-in part of the tool as well. Okay, any more questions? All right. Yes, sir. Um, since you guys uh, mentioned streaming, what happens if the network goes down while I'm using uh, Visio? Then you don't have Visio. Now, re realistically, what we're trying to do when we onboard these, um, we have to take a little conservative approach. So Visio may be interrupted when you don't have that, right? But um, if what we're trying to do for our first approach, we're going to take um, Site Manager. The database lives in central office. I could have site manager up here all day long, but if it's down, it's not going to matter, right? So we just have to be very, make the user aware and very conservative with our first approach because we want to make this a success. So we're gonna start with, we have some criteria of how we're going to first integrate the apps to move forward. Um, but that is a good question. Your network does become an actual point of failure. So when we integrate this and we, when we develop it, we wanna make sure that they are aware is if this is here, you're not going to get it. But we don't want to put somebody in a situation where I'm a director on a plane and I can't stream my application. We don't want to do that. So our original approach is going to be a hybrid approach um, for the application such as if Visio. So, but if you have to check out Visio and you only need it for five days, we just have to make the user aware that network is an actual constraint now for that. I don't want it to be a deterrent because it's a great thing to do, but we'll take a more conservative approach for that. But yeah, and, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead. No. I mean, with us sharing, showing you in the demo where we was jumping from device, device, device. So within that case, if Physio does go down, say you've got uh, your DDD, he's sitting in, you know, your district, and uh, the network goes out down at the district. He has the ability to pull up that MiFi. Once he gets connected back up to that MiFi, that application, that document's going to come right back up exactly where it left it. So when that session gets killed, when that network dies, he's not losing data. He's lo losing the ability to stream that data down to his computer. So no data is going to be lost if that network dies. It's just a, that time that he could jump on another network, he or she could jump on another network and, and get that application back up. So it's not as detrimental as what we have now in VDI where if you lose that session, it's turn, terminated and gone. This is if you lose that session, you lose the session, but your data is still there until you get that network back up and running. So. Yeah, and, and the one thing to think about is, you know, the network doesn't become a dependency. It is a dependency today, right? So, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was in Massachusetts at a system integrator up there. Something happened during construction and their basement got flooded and they had their networking, all their networking gear was in the basement. Well, the network in this location was down. You know what really happens when that happens? Everyone goes home, right? So, that, I mean, that, that's 75% that's of the people all left. And guess what? The people who left and were on Citrix could still work. Right, you pop in an LTE, go in a different way, you could still get access to the network. We can create redundancy and resiliency into that network so it's not a single point where the apps and data are being delivered from. And you know they might go home and have a better experience than they did than sitting around in the office waiting for the network to come back up, right? So it gives you a lot of options and you know it's not something new creating a network as, as a dependency, it is today, but we have ways to build re resiliency into that and, and try to make sure that you have uh, you know, as much uptime as possible. Any other questions? Well, you don't get to ask a question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, two things. Can you touch on the legacy apps? 
applications and how those may help out in our environment and all right, I get where you're going with this. Um, so Citrix, uh, the, when we stream an app, it's, it's physically running on the back end as a server. So we have some uh, Windows 7 applications that for some reason they don't run in Windows 10 or they have issues or they're a pain to get installed in Windows 10. Literally through Citrix, we have the ability to run that in a Windows Server 20, 2008 R2 environment long enough to keep that application around until uh, Windows 7 and Windows 2008 R2 dies. So we don't have to worry about trying to shoehorn those application into Windows 10 and literally go directly to Windows 10, not have to worry about backwards compatibility of apps. All we have to do is worry about when is Microsoft really going to finish that or kill that operating system. So it gives us flexibility to extend those applications life out further and further um, and gives the, the app dev team uh, a better time to get those applications upgraded instead of you know us pushing you to Windows 10, you have that time to, to keep that application alive. The other thing that uh, Alex was talking about is um, there's an application that we put in Citrix. It's a uh, penguin. It's the penguin snowplow application. I don't know, it calibrates some penguin that runs around behind the truck. <laughs> so uh, the application is an old application um, and it requires a USB to COM port, USB to serial port. I forget what the adapter is. Um, but we're like, heck, let's try it. So. We put it in Citrix, it works great, and they're like, there's no way that this USB to COM port is going to work, you know. Yeah, it did. It did. He actually, uh, Alex took it out to his mechanic, plugged it in, he plugged it into the truck, and he was able to get data. Or... Yeah. They fed the penguin, he kept running, so. <laughs> Yeah, just uh, from a user experience perspective, and it was mentioned kind of how old Citrix is, right? So um, I've been with Citrix almost 20 years. Citrix is about 12 years older than I am, um, my time here. Um, but the, the important element is two things. One is from a user experience, we're, we started delivering virtual apps when like 9,600 bald modems were fast. Right, so people used to dial into phone banks, and that's what—that's how they access their Citrix applications. So, um, we have a lot of experience with bad networks, um, slow, latent networks. So, um, the protocols are optimized for that. Um, but the other element, and this is really to the point that was just made, right, is um, our experience is with the end user. And so, I. I I've heard from conversations both today and in the past, right, that the when when VDI solutions are deployed, a lot of times what people are really looking at is, hey, how do I make sure that I can bring everything into the data center and manage it better? But what gets forgotten a lot of times is that person that sits at the other end of the keyboard that really needs to do something. And so we spend a lot of time and development on experience, and that experience goes down to the peripheral device that gets connected in, right? So, hey, I have this USB scanner, this some odd device that needs to be connected all the way back into the data center. And so it's really important to us because it's really quick for a user to say, I'm not using this because it sucks, right? And so user experience is very much uh, the key to, uh, I mean, it's part of our secret sauce. It's, it's how we get users to feel better about using a solution that, you know, honestly, nobody really liked the desktop under their desk being replaced or partially replaced by a thin client, right? Most of the projects I've ever been on, it's, what are you doing? This thing heats my feet in the winter. I like it, right? Um, but it, it, it's, uh, it's amazing, though, if you can give them a capability like, hey, network goes down, I can go somewhere else and work, right? Or, hey, I don't, hey, I have to send somebody a quick file. I don't have to go and find my way to it, to my desk or to my home and VPN in. I can actually do it from my phone, right? Those are work experience things 
that makes people's lives better and obviously in the end helps the adoption of a technology like this. Yeah, and when, when you're replacing the thin clients and you know those Agile thin clients are, are really good, they're, they're, people are using a lot of those today. Um, the trick is, give them a bigger monitor and a new keyboard. <laughs> they, don't, they won't know the difference, right, if you're using Citrix in the back. Any other questions? Way in the back. Yeah, well, I guess, when you roll this out, are you going to take away like, all the local programming at all? Like, so like, if we have to configure something in the field, will, will they not be able to run any local programs at all? They'll have to have whatever connection back? No. I mean, uh, we're not going to be able to take everything away. Um, There'll still be special cases, um, like you guys out in the field, you know. Um, the objective for the application streaming, like Wally said, is, is if the application requires a live connection back to ODOT, why not stream it? For those applications that don't require that live, live connection back to, you know, center office or the, the SOC, um, those are going to be done on a one-on-one -on -one basis to see if it makes sense. Um, we're not standing up here and saying that we're taking our entire OS image and every application that we have out there and it's going to be streamed through Citrix. We're not saying that. We're just saying that, you know, in the past we've had issues getting applications. I mean, right now inside ServiceNow we're doing software deployment through ServiceNow. What, we have 10% of the applications maybe that ODOT has. Um, if you, you can see over there, um, some of the apps that we've done, uh, OVARS. I know OVARS is a pain in the butt to deploy. We can't deploy it. You got ARS, Estimator. I mean, some of these applications that don't have a good silent install, don't have a good you know, way to deploy them out, we literally, we install it once and everybody's got it. So um, I hope that answered your question. I don't know if it did or not, but if I didn't, we'll talk later. <laughs> Any other questions? No. Yes, sir. Uh, how about the software? How about them? They're great. Um, so it'll, this thing. Hello. Better. So update for the software. It's going to work almost the same that it works now, right? Um, if there is a patch for an application, you still have a rolling upgrade that will have to patch an application. So we implemented a reboot every week right now, right? So you'll still be subject to that reboot and we will patch accordingly. And if there's an update, we can patch the streaming servers as of right now. And then we'll schedule a reboot for the servers to go down to actually consume the new image. So it'll still follow the same path that we follow. And actually, it will actually speed it up. So you, you will receive updates in a more timely manner and it's, it'll be, I'm not gonna say seamless, I'm not saying seamless. It'll be seamless to the end user. Non-disruptive, unless you're Mike Dotz and Sean reboots your server while you're using it, but it's just a POC, right Dan? You know what POC stands for? POC is production on completion. <laughs> That's what Dan said. Oh, right. No, he didn't. I, did. I don't want to get him in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's his boss's boss. I know. <laughs> um, but no, it'll, it will be seamless and non-disruptive to the end user. And we will still, be, we'll still have our WSUS testing group, but it'll be people in their apps, not people in their computers. So we still need volunteers. Thank you all for attending, because when you signed up, you're now WSUS testing group. <laughs> Sorry about your luck. Um, but it'll be your apps now when you test. So we're going to make you guys, honestly, all joking aside, you guys are all subject for um, IT stuff. So we have to eat our own dog food first. Um, does that answer your question, yeah. Mr. Mann? Drink your own champagne. Y yes. <laughs> Any other questions? No. <laughs> it's not Wednesday. Yes, sir. This all sounds really expensive. Are we going to be able to afford it? <laughs> well, <laughs> Decimal Dan has a problem. It, it goes too far to the right. Maybe we can put it like three to the left. 
That's a good question. That's not, that's not up to the side. We're talking. <laughs> <laughs> There's your answer. Did, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. I, and we'd like to thank Citrix for all their help. I mean, thank you guys for flying in. We could have done it without you. Steve, Dan, we really appreciate you guys coming at any time. And those are better gummy worms, by the way. I like those. So next time.